We're now going to proceed to the Q&A question and answer. I'd like to ask the panel presenters to move up to the desk up front here. Um, I want to thank my colleague, Gwen David, who will be helping us with the wireless microphone, a little Phil Donahue, I guess, is the reference we've been using. <laughs> so I'll be moderating the discussion, uh, and we'll pitch in with an additional mic. But if you have any questions for me, feel free to ask as well. Um, so are there any questions for the panel? Yes. Uh, please do wait for the mic to come to you before you state your question. Thanks. Somebody brought up assessment in their session. I think it was you, Barbara, or I forgot your name. Um, do you guys do assessment at all? Besides the instructor review observation, but any kind of formalized assessment? There we go. Um, I have done assessment in the past. Um, I haven't in, the, in, in the, this current program that I described at Columbia, but when I was at Yale, we did institute an assessment program um, where we used some um, pre and post tests. And the problem is very similar to what was described. Those sat in our offices and we didn't do a lot with them. So I think that they're, um, I'd love to hear from Scott, but I, I think I think we've all tried different assessment techniques. I think assimilating that assessment or having a full assessment cycle where you actually take what you've learned and apply it is, I think individual instructors in my experience have been able to use that assessment. So we would ask things like, did, did we give the students enough time to do their own work? Then you could turn that into changing the way you teach. But programmatically, I guess I, I haven't had a lot of luck with assessment, but I'd, I'd love to hear from others. I, we, uh have a sort of generic um, tool that we use at the end of every session. Um, our, I think our better answer to assessment is, is that we also have programmed into our yearly schedule a, a time to collect more data from newer graduate students about what they want. So rather than asking them only to react to which which we do a little bit to, re to react to what they got we try to also be planning for what we're going to do in the next semester I mean the so the research breakfasts that I mentioned we had regular classes kind of at a crunch point in the middle of the semester before but attendance could be spotty because people couldn't make it or they were in their other class and s literally a graduate student said you know it'd be great if I could just come by and have a cup of coffee and talk to somebody and that was because we had carved out time to ask them again. So, I mean, part of that, I think, is just getting in the habit of constantly getting data from people. I, th I don't remember who mentioned about giving out assignments and then gathering them and not knowing what to do with them. Uh, was there ever the idea of uh, making the assignment related to what they were doing so that that way it would make sense and they would actually it it was related to what they're doing all of our sessions are geared toward those assignment whether it's go write what you feel about a piece at the Met or something much more involved in research almost like I feel like some of our assignments are on the graduate level even though it's undergraduate so within that huge range like yes all of our classes are specifically geared towards that but what happened what I was talking about is that worksheet that we had mm -hmm. done came back. And then there's not a mechanism for it to, uh, I graded it, but I'm the librarian. I'm not the faculty member. We needed to, yeah. to work more closely with the faculty member to get that mechanism to get buy-in from the faculty member to s somehow add it into their syllabus. I mean, you know, we're doing this, yeah. So again, you know, we're trying to struggle with that. So I guess we have to meet with them before, but then they don't really have faculty meetings, so you know, we got to get them, I guess, before they do the syllabus, so that somehow this counts as a grade or a check mark or, or, or something. So that, that's what, yeah. I'd just like to make a point about that in terms of assessment. I think the best assessment we could do, and I think this is hard to imagine, but would be able to, to see the student research product at the end of the term. So we, we, you know, we think of instruction as an intervention. We do this intervention. Does it change the outcome? Faculty will tell us loosely. So we have done some faculty surveys to say, does, does the quality of your student work seem to be better when you had a, a library instruction session? And that's anecdotal and, and um, kind of hard to, to really take and do anything with. But if we could actually look at, have a control group that didn't get library um, instruction and then look at other groups that did to try to say, what, what's the quality of their citations? Are they... Um, 
there's research out there that will tell you that students, when they do, when they cite um, papers, they'll tend to cite from the first one or two pages of that paper, meaning that they, you know, they're reading the first couple of pages, maybe online or, or even in print, but they're not going deeper into it. You know, there are ways I think that we could engage with the final research product that would tell us a little bit more about what our our work has done. But that's a really big challenge I think to get faculty to agree to that type of thing. Scott, I was, I was fascinated by your discussion of uh, analyzing the graduate population and, and, and analyzing the segments. I see a lot of that among the curatorial staff, and mm. of course they also have the same arc uh, in terms of uh, production and, and research. But it offers sort of a, an infinite number of mix and match possibilities, and you have to come up with tailored programs. You have to prepare programs for each of these segments as you analyze them. I was wondering about the process that you, you know, between the fact that you identified you had segments and coming up with these programs, how you actually did that in a, in a, in a group or an individual? Uh, I would say we try to do the worst ones. I mean, honestly, the places where, you know, it was the most glaring need. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't all just driven by what they were saying. I mean, it was also things that we were recognizing in what was going on in, in uh, you know, in certain areas or, or with certain groups of students. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, I, I'd like to say there was, there was more science to it, but honestly there isn't. And, and, you know, since we did it, the, whenever we started this, I guess four, four years ago now, we've been backfilling a little bit. So, for instance, that uh, publishing your dissertation class, or that it's called after the dissertation, that class is m only about a year and a half old because we didn't feel like we had the legs to do it at first. And, I, I mean, you mentioned the, the amount of preparation. So, I mean, part of what we've done is all of, all of the classes are, are, to a certain extent, modulari modularized. Is that a word? Does anyone know? There's a lot of... of um, bits and pieces that you can bring in and out of a class and some of the classes are only one bit or piece different than another class but they're um, cast in a different way or framed in a different way or, or we try to make them appeal to a different audience with the way we market them even. Um, once we had some of that stuff built up then we've had a little bit more room to start um, going for kind of more niche sorts of things. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think we anticipated the, the dissertation class being nearly as popular as it's turned out to be. We didn't think it was such a need, but it, 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 and it could just be NYU's fault, but nobody was really dealing with those people. <laughs> and they, I mean, every time we have it, you know, 40 or something people come, and we have it once a semester, so it's pretty big. So I, I don't know. It's, a not, it's not a great answer, but that's kind of been our process. I had a question about the peer observation because um, I'm sure you're all, all of us are strained with how many classes we can teach and, and all that. So how often are classes observed? And also you said you don't use a script anymore. So how do the librarians collaborate on the presentation in advance also? That's a um, great question. So in terms of the peer observation, uh, we ask that you, you just watch one class in the course of the semester. People do more, depending on time, but we really just want people to, to go and, and watch one, if, if possible. And so over the course of the year, that's, um, you know, they'll see two, and after a few years, you'll have seen a lot of your colleagues teach. So that's how that um, has worked out. And I'm sorry, the second part of your question was? Oh, without the script. Yeah, actually, that's a great question. So. Um, with the way these courses have developed, we, we have this teaching cohort, 15 um, librarians, and we have the, the, um, the directors of the writing center who actually deal with this piece of the core um, curriculum at Columbia come talk to us. And they tell us about what, what the focus is that particular year. So that gives us a little bit of a baseline. We at least know what they're engaged with um, in the particular year. This year it just happened that they were doing things on sustainability and um, I can't remember what the other kind of thematic uh, 
organization was. But so we had that baseline. And then we used the principles that I talked about. And, um, but everyone does some really different things with this kind of focus on active learning. So we share things. So we've got a great concept map exercise that we share among all of us. Happy to share that with, with all of you, where um, a lot of people are, are integrating that to get at this kind of notion of active learning and also breaking up the lecture. We have a great peer review exercise, which we share among the instructors, where we give people a paragraph from three different sources, very different sources, say a New York Times editorial, scholarly uh, peer-reviewed article, and maybe um, a kind of trade journal. And the students have to match up which paragraph goes with which source, bringing up topics of kind of tone and audience and that type of thing. We share that exercise. Um, we use the craft of research. How many of you know the craft of research? wonderful primer uh, for at the undergraduate level for research. It's um, fantastic for getting students to just starting in research, um, a kind of framework for it. There's a three sentence construction in the craft of research that a lot of us use to kick off our class, which is I am researching X because I want to find out in order to help my reader understand. And so there, these are writing classes. We open our instruction session with the students writing. They create that. They circle their keywords, and now they're off and running, ready to do something really active in the session based on their research problem. So we share that exercise. So we sort of share the methodology, but what we actually teach during the class is really up to both what the writing instructor wants us to do and what we think will be most effective. We also have an instruction menu we send all instructors, which allows them to check off, you know, do you want us to cover keyword searching, subject searching, borrow direct, which is, um, or ILL. Do you want a stack tour? Some people still want that physical tour. So armed with all of this, we can create a kind of meaningful instruction session a lot of work. I'm not. I'm not saying it's not. But what the result, what results from it, is actually something I think that students can really engage with. Um, I was also interested in this particular type of class you taught, in which you gave them articles and the students came up with research questions. I'm working with the head of our writing center doing a game like that right now. But it's separate from our library instruction. It's something we went to the classroom and did, and it's gone through different permutations. But what I wanted to know is when you teach it, they come up with the research questions, and then you said after that you run a class geared to those questions. So what I wanted to know is time-wise, from the time you start until the class is over, what kind of time do you figure on teaching that class? Um, so these classes were 75 minutes long. And so the first uh, sort of 10 to 15 were the students engaging with the actual materials. And what's amazing is they don't need a whole lot of time to come up with some things, especially if they're working in groups. So they, everyone had their folders. They probably spent a minute looking through the documents as individuals, and this is that think, pair, share. So you give them a minute or two to really think about what's in front of them. Uh, they talk as a group for maybe five to seven minutes, and then they share back. Now, you can't tackle every research question that comes up, but you'll see some commonalities that start to emerge. You can almost group them. We did a kind of whiteboard exercise where we started writing up questions and making connections. So this research question is like this research question. And to be honest, there was a framework behind this. There was the kind of, um, we knew we wanted to show them how to find facts or reference materials, kind of that type of, of inquiry. We wanted to show them how to find books and how to find articles. You can hang all those research questions off one of those categories. And so there was probably, so we've already looked at maybe 15 to 20 minutes of, of the active piece, another 15 minutes uh, to 20 minutes of talking them through the catalog, one representative database using terms that they could you know use in, in other um, settings and then actually giving them some time to work so it's uh, it can feel it, it took a long time for people to get comfortable with this structure and you know, it's no can searches you know this is you, you, there's going to be some failure and that's that's a little bit scary but uh, we found that students there was a higher instance of um, them coming to do follow-up consultations with us so we had that extra time to to work with them and um, and, and, and it worked, but there were things that got dropped. We didn't get to talk about uh, the stack map or, as I said, ILL. There were certain things that just didn't happen, but the timing really, we kind of chunked it out where there was a third of the time we were talking and then the other time they were really working on, on active projects. Hands on, yeah.
Sure. It's great that it sounds like you have two moments where you're seeing them in the classroom and in the library session. That's a good thing. Um, this is a question maybe mainly for Caitlin, but if anyone else wants to address it, um, if you have come up with any good ideas for reaching adjunct faculty, because that is something <laughs> we struggle <laughs> with a lot too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, we just started, um, we had another pilot project at SVA <laughs> um, that uh, we've, because we're always looking for that partnership and the librarian faculty partnership, but this is something a little bit different. It's a library liaison, so we've taken all of our librarians, divided up all of those uh, undergraduate, graduate programs, uh, divvied them up among all of us. And that's also a little bit linked to our, um, our collection development assignments that we each have as well. And uh, we reached out to, to, the, to the departments and just kind of let them know. But what, what we have found is that instead of um, contacting the chair, contact their assistant. <laughs> it's just so, I mean, that somehow, you know, and so we're hoping by just in this generalized uh, liaison outreach that uh, the lecture, the library instruction will also be a component of that as well as collection development. But, you know, I mean, and then just, just sending out like just, hey, you know, we now have the uh, Vogue, the Vogue database. Do you mind uh, sending that out to your professors? Because it's the... Um, we found that if I send them um, directly, the faculty members, it doesn't get read. So if it comes through through the department, so that's one. I mean, a very simplistic thing, and that's what we've found so far. We're trying to lobby our human resources to have that their orientation for the new faculty members be a visit to the library as well. So that was another thing we thought of. we haven't got them to, uh, to buy into it yet. But again, that that would be an example of that idea. Float the idea; it doesn't work. Keep trying. So, you know, um, but yeah, so, you know, we're just always trying to think of things, but that would be two things that um, we're trying off the top of my head. And I don't know, anybody else has any other the adjuncts? <laughs> the one thing I would say in my other life as the librarian for the School of Education um, is that um, a lot of our adjuncts are teaching the required courses a lot of the time. and. So the places where I've had the most luck with adjuncts is where there's somebody who is running the required course, and I try to get that person in my pocket, and they say to their adjuncts, oh, and by the way, the sixth week, you're all going to the library. That's the only thing I've gotten a lot of traction with, honestly. A lot to say yeah, on that, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, I mean, other than hard. if you have a little money, a wine and cheese reception gets people into the library. I mean, that's it's food, as you said, yeah. you getting yeah. people in and making that personal contact. But I think that you know, it's that 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 takes resources that sometimes aren't available. Anyone out there have any? Yeah, yeah ones? I would love to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, food does work, not only for the adjunct, for the student, because I'm having a workshop all this week and I'm providing food all week just to attract and keep them there. And food is offering, not at the beginning, but at the end. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I find an incentive, like a prize for the students, actually works. Sometimes I have my workshop for the student and, and I put a prize in there. It's an incentive to get them to come, something they, they, they do need, it works. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be really good if everybody gave their I'm Marie October. I'm the branch campus librarian in the College of New Rochelle. I'm Naomi Niles from uh, the libraries here at the Met. 
And my question was about marketing and reaching the instructors so that you can do the class, but I wanted to uh, say a sidebar. If you do have students coming in for individual consults, that seems like it's a, a great piece of your assessment. I mean, if you can mm, show that. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have a good mm. percentage. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mine was marketing is sort of a follow-up. How do you do that when they're it's not a required class? And it's so obvious that the students, we have a lot of community college students, and it's they just need this help. Yeah. Um, the graduate classes that I described are all not course integrated in any way, so we can't rely on faculty making, making or whatever people go. Um, our, I guess I would say, well, A, we've got a lot of them. B, we, um, appeal to their sense of fear a lot, honestly. Because <laughs> um, they're graduate students and you know we are, we're especially, we have a lot of sessions right at the beginning of the fall semester. And um, you know the feedback that we've gotten is that most people are in those sessions because they feel like they're underpowered to be a graduate student. And they've maybe even sat in a class or two. And they're and so uh, honestly, our, our, our blurbs, and I have obviously, you know, I have pretty good connections with the schools and the admins in the schools to get the to get the um, advertisements out but I think the language is is important and the timing we're our, our initial slate of classes in the fall is over by the second week of the semester after which you know if we if we uh, we've played with that timing a lot but after about the well to about the second and a half um, attendance drops precipitously because nobody who's a new graduate student has time to do anything except read. So uh, I think timing is really key. And then we'll hit, we hit them again when it's, um, you know, those research breakfasts are always around paper writing time or, or you know, lit, re lit review time. So I think that that, that helps also. I, d I guess I would just say that um, some, so a lot of what we do is, is hooked to a class, so the faculty will push the students to go. But we have also started this series of research clinics, which are, it sounds like both of you have described something similar, these kind of drop-in clinics that um, are at kind of point of need times in the semester. And so we're doing them now, right at this moment, because it's pre-Thanksgiving, we know there's a lot of research papers due, and it's just two hours where there is a handful of librarians in the room, and people can drop in with their paper topic, and we will sit down with them, and we have a writing tutor in the room as well. So kind of looking to pair with other people on campus who can kind of bring this one, this this intensive moment where they, they need to write and they need to do research to have both people in the room, and we are able to advertise those through um, big digital signs in a lot of our libraries. Um, we're really trying to take advantage of social media, though I'm not sure how to assess the impact of that yet. We need to think more about that, but um, we are just trying. I think that timing is is a key to marketing. That if people see something anywhere in print or email or whatever, if it hits them at that point of need, then you're I think in good shape. Word of mouth, too, I mean, I find you can just get that one department um, that we're doing, and then, you know, word of mouth helps as well. The library director at SVA now goes to the department meetings as well. He hadn't previously, because I think it was libraries considered an administrative, but now he does go to the department chair meeting, so that's another way to pimp out our services, you know, just <laughs> wherever, <laughs> wherever you can do it. <laughs> Um, so that, you know, again, like for us, we're just trying, you know, we're always looking for a more formalized mechanism, but, you know, I mean, just trying, you don't want to overwhelm people with email blasts or things as well, so, you know, word of mouth and is what's working for us now, but we'll try anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a follow-up because we are very much trying to reach out to the community college audience that does come um, and other undergraduates who come, they're assigned a, an object in the Metropolitan Museum and, and we've been trying to get traction and so I have handouts <laughs> for everyone to take back to their schools Great. about the classes that we want to offer and we're offering to come to your institution or have your students come here. Um, so please take one of these flyers. 
That's great. So Naomi, watch it. A whole assignment now. The class comes in with that assignment. I'll just say, just so here's the 45 minute deal. It's 45 seconds. Go to the Met. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's difficult for us because you know we're not staffed to. No. When you have 30 people come one after the other in small groups, yeah. mm -hmm. we'd rather d do some group instruction. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So that's th that's behind this. We do have this room for a while longer if you have, if there are other questions. Um, yes. Uh, I'm from uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice from CUNY. And I have a question. All of you were talking about changing uh, your instructional approach and programming. And uh, my question is, how have you achieved it? How is it uh, being done at your institution? For example, at John Jay, we do everything by committee, which is wonderfully democratic, but <laughs> you can imagine some things will never fly. And uh, I'm just curious if it's uh, you know a whole group of people deciding or noticing that something is not working, or if somebody is actually in the position to like spearhead the change, or if you had any uh, suggestions on how actually to get people excited about, you know, looking back at their teaching and wanting to make it better. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll comment on this because actually, in my my job at Yale, that was what I was hired to do. There, I was hired to help librarians become better teachers. And that was, I think, a kind of unique position. Um, a lot of institutions don't have that. And so uh, what what I did with a team of people was um, looked at other resources on campus. So there was an education program. And a lot of, I think, our institutions have education programs. Museums have education programs. Um, uh, colleges of education or local, uh, I think of Columbia has the teacher's college. There, there are a lot of people who are thinking about instructional design and it might even be instructional technologists who are thinking about this, but they come at this with principles that um, can be really helpful. So one session that I was able to put together is I had the head of our writing center come and talk about instructional design. and. I'll tell you that it makes a lot more impact on librarians to hear from external people than to hear from a fellow librarian, unfortunately. I think that, and, and some of that is we don't have this expertise. We're not trained to be teachers. This is a real failing in our, our, um, in our education. I think that it continues to be. From what I understand, library schools are not engaging with teaching. And it's my contention that that's only going to become a more important part of our job to be respected by faculty. We need to know how to teach. And so by finding experts who do this for a living, who instructional designers, people who teach people how to teach, bringing them in. So I um, was able to do a kind of a three-part workshop one summer where we brought in the head of the Writing Center, the head of our Instructional Technology Group, and I'm trying to remember who the third person was now. But 90-minute um, sessions, and some of them were based on active learning principles, so they, they were run like active learning exercises, um, giving us practical um, ex kind of experience in doing that type of thing. So bringing in people to to teach how to teach, if you can do that. And I think that you know, being in a place like New York or in the New York area, there's a lot of people out there who could do that kind of thing. Um, I guess, I mean, we, we still sort of walk a little bit of a line because we have a lot of other teaching programs that are going on, and especially those subject selectors who are supposed to be and are. I don't mean to say that they're not. Um, you know, the people who are really aligned with their graduate students. The pitch, I think, there has been there's plenty to go around there's you know we're not stepping on your toes like you are the subject person that's great but wouldn't it be nice if when you walked into the classroom you didn't have to worry that some percentage of that classroom didn't know what a database was or had never heard of the idea of bibliographic management or you know were terrified of you so um that's that's that kind of horizontal layer that we sort of go for in our program i don't i mean we just sort of built it and tried to didn't tried to not step on toes a little bit and and um i don't know i think it's now it's just kind of a fact of life and it's been easier but i don't i don't I, I, it could be a top down thing sometimes i guess but it wasn't i mean we just we saw some needs and we just tried to tackle them so i mean it helps to have allies obviously you don't have to do it alone yeah. I, I mean i agree too i think it's taken me a while just to to get the confidence just to do it you know I mean sometimes you know you just kind of want it to be I want 
to speak to everybody and have across the campus this curriculum design. But yeah, you know, I'm not the provost. I mean, I'm just, you know, so just let's just do it. And there's, I mean, again, SVA has that different structure. We're smaller and there's three of us who are teaching. So we'll just meet and just kind of implement these ideas and, and, and that's okay. I mean, luckily the library director, we work in an atmosphere where, where um, that's actually encouraged and it's an acceptable to do that. But, you know, sometimes there's, in between gray areas where maybe you can just go ahead and just go ahead and try and implement something and it doesn't necessarily have to be this big thing but just small little tweaks i mean just trying you know i feel like we're just kind of scratching the the surface as far as these active learning things and it's just things i mean i haven't even read any of the books that barbara has talked about directly i mean i'm reading things through uh, the library literature that when I get a chance to peruse it and so it's been um, kind of filtered through that and I'm like okay active learning that sounds good let's just try that so I don't know just just try it just leave even just little little tweaks and and you know Barbara mentioned too just not having the canned searches it's a little scary and it can be you know you're gonna you're gonna fail and not find anything but you know just go for it and use that as turn that into learning experience and you know I've just been in standing in front of classes and no this is not in the Grove Dictionary of Art but Wikipedia is fabulous so okay so maybe you want to use Wikipedia here but still going forward the Grove it you know and then just just kind of try and turn it into to your advantage I don't know if that was helpful I actually have a question for the university and college librarians. Um, our curatorial staff, I guess it's fair to say, are a, somewhat akin to faculty. Um, you know, I explained some of the challenges that we have getting in touch with them. Do any of you do, how do you get to your faculty or do they just come along with the workshops? As you're saying, Barbara, that's a sort of requirement in your case, but is there anything that you do exclusively for them or for fellows you might have? Barbara Scott, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we've, we've talked about doing um, drop-in sessions or doing uh, drop-in faculty sessions uh, for faculty as well. We haven't done it. I mean, part of that is, again, going back to the literature that, you know, you have this great idea and nobody shows up. So we haven't done it because we thought we'd like to wait for, uh, maybe we should just offer food and that would just... <laughs> be the way maybe that's what we're lacking something that would give a, just a little bit more um, impetus for for people to come in so as of yet no we haven't actually but I mean I can't it's a need because I can't tell you how many library instructions I'm sure um, you all will have the same experience that the the faculty member themselves is like I had no idea I had, they're just we've blown them away about all the stuff that, that we can do so there's definitely a need for us to educate the faculty as well so then they can become proselytize and energize their their students as well um, so no as of at SVA we're just again within the classes um, but we would like to <laughs> not with the grad program that I'm talking about here because those are really honestly we bypass the faculty for a lot of those programs um, but in terms of the subject selectors who have the liaison relationships with the departments, you know, we really rely on them to make that relationship work. And in fact, you know, when we throw the grad classes, they're one of the conduits into their population, certainly. Um, I, you know, I, the thing, I, the shift I, I see, uh, this, is the, this is the only thing that I, I'm kind of curious about right now is that, you know, I think my colleagues who are in the humanities still can kind of pin that relationship on materials to a certain extent and on collections and oh look at this great stuff that we've got um, whereas I'm over in the social sciences and I think that more and more of my liaison role with my faculty is about instruction and about teaching and about again almost like saying to faculty I can take on some of that work that that um, maybe you don't want to do or you don't feel comfortable to do because you don't actually know it because when you got your PhD it was a different world. Um, obviously I don't say that to them. Um, but you know uh, that instructional relationship has started to become kind of for me the crux of my liaison relationship with people is that I'm a partner in helping your students not be bad. And it really, it, I, I mean honestly kind of is that conversation a lot of the time. 
I'm going to make a few comments, and then I think my colleagues in back um, at the Avery Library might have some things to say, too, about faculty engagement, because I haven't been around. Sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think what has kind of worked is lo always looking for a different conversation to have with them. You talked about what that conversation might look like, but two areas that I think have been interesting is the um, we have an institutional repository that uh, faculty can deposit their articles in, and that's an interesting different kind of conversation to have with them about what the library can do for them in terms of their scholarship, We're talking about that end of the scholarly spectrum that Scott talked about. They have scholarly output, and they want it to be read by as many people as possible. We know that the average readership for an academic article is pretty low, put it in an open access um, institutional repository, it goes up, impact factors go up. This is a great conversation to have with your faculty and to convince them that this is something the library is involved with. Uh, we've also had a little bit of traction around the area of digital humanities as a kind of new trendy topic. Um, faculty are interested in it. It's a different kind of conversation to have with them. And I think all of us have interesting things that are happening in the library, in the field, that enable those different kinds of conversations. Any other questions or? Okay. So just getting back to assessment, does anybody use clickers in the uh, under undergraduate sessions or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have a question. Clickers? Oh. Anyone use clickers? Do you use clickers in your session? Oh, clickers. For assessment. We, I think oh. we're specking a system for a new classroom we're building, but we've, I've never used them. Has anybody in here used them? Do you have? Never. Should ask the audience. Yeah. Yeah, 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 or um, here comes the mic. <laughs> um, I'm Jennifer Rosenstein. I'm from Pace University downtown. Um, I have used clickers not so much for assessment, but more for engagement and just kind of to check, like, okay, do you, uh, you know, like, is everybody comfortable moving on from whatever we were talking about, the catalog or the databases? But I have shift a lot of I've shifted to, mo to using Poll Everywhere. I don't know if everyone has ever used it. It's a, s it's a website, polleverywhere.com. It's totally free. Students can enter responses online or text them in by their f with their phones. Um, and you can do multiple choice or little open-ended things. So I'll like, usually short polls, like, you know, what's the first thing that you do for research? Usually it's like, you know, 90% use Google. So it's just, a, it's mainly a, a student engagement tactic. Hi, I'm, I'm from uh, okay, I'm from Fordham University. I believe uh, in your presentation here at the Met Library, you had indicated that you're experimenting with remote access. Um, remote instruction. Go ahead. Yes, instruction. Yes, uh, and and I'm wondering it the scope of the content that you were using, and perhaps if you experienced any uh, consultation sessions that would result from that. Um. The remote instruction we're doing, or the virtual instruction, is actually uh, one team in particular, the visiting researchers team, um, would tend naturally to go for virtual instruction because we're trying to, they are trying to get to that pool of users, which is unknown, which are not yet using the Watson Library. So by that, all I meant to say was they are putting uh, information on the library's catalog and the library's website, such as little quick guides to tell people how they can register from home. Uh, you know, this is about two and a half years old now, I think. Uh, formerly, people had to come physically to the Watson Library to start the registration process to become a patron and to then get a library card to be able to request books. You can now do all of that from home, remotely, um, so that things are ready uh, when you come to the library. We're not a circulating collection, of course, so um, to have your books ready and waiting for you on the shelf to consult immediately is a good benefit to you, uh, to the outside user. So that's what I meant by remote instruction. Um, Secondly, the Nolan Library staff, um, the Nolan Library is our sort of public library and it's open to users of all ages. They are collaborating, collaborating also with this visiting researchers instruction team to um, reach out to the New York City undergraduate and community college environment. And they're doing that, as Naomi mentioned, through instruction, but we're also experimenting with creating video tutorials, just sort of screen casting for, um, again, quick guides for how to find information on objects in the museum. That's still in the experiment experimentation process. We haven't posted anything online yet. So just very simple things. Um, we're not so quite so cutting edge. <laughs> so that, did I answer your question? OK. 
Okay, so then if there are no other questions, I want to invite you all to the Watson Library for a reception. If you don't know how to get there, you can just follow me and a few other Watsonians here. I'd also like to remind you that the museum is open till 8.45, so you can wander out and see the exhibitions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.